Somebody's watching over you and Sonny. This might be your day, your golden day today, Sonny. This might be your New York City, a vast megalopolis, a city teeming with millions, a city whose streets have become the breeding grounds for crime and violence. It was in this city that Sonny Argonzoni spent his formative years. He walked these streets. This is where he made lifelong friendships. It was in these streets that Sonny Argonzoni found himself entangled in the web of drug addiction. Today he is the founder and director of Victory Outreach and author of the bestseller, Once a Junkie. When Sonny was converted, God placed a calling on his life to go back to the ghetto, back to the shooting galleries, back to the prisons, to take the message of deliverance. Sonny understands the agony of heroin addiction. He understands that desperate cry. It's that despairing cry that has compelled him to dedicate the rest of his life to reaching others. Yo, brother! What's that new, my man? What's going on, man? Hey, check this out, bro. You got a cigarette, man? Yo, but you spare them? Get that ring, get the ring. Get the ring, get the money, come on. Get the money, hurry up. I got it, man! Ready? You call it out, I'll kill you, you hear me? Uh. It's been really a miracle. When he started going out with that company, I was so worried. I tried to help him myself my own way. I tried hard. Day after day, he was getting worse and worse. He was getting in trouble. Every day, more and more. So I kept worrying and worrying until one day I knew I couldn't do it by myself. Somebody told me he was on drugs and I couldn't believe it. But then when he went to jail, I knew it was true that he was on drugs. That was horrible for me. I couldn't take it. I started praying day and night. Then God spoke to me. I had a great experience. When God told me, don't worry, everything's going to be all right. He couldn't believe that God could speak to me. but. That was true, he spoke to me, because I prayed day and night for years. And then, uh, th then that's what happened one night. I had a phone call that he gave his heart to God. And I was so happy, and I thank God that now he's a preacher, he's a minister, and I'm very proud of him. The tombs, the name is all it implies. Behind those thick, cold, concrete walls is the perpetual stopover on the junkie's journey into death. My first introduction to Sonny was back in 1961 when Reverend Dave Wilkerson came to me and he said, uh, Paul, he says, you are very familiar with the criminal justice system in New York and we have one of our young converts by the name of Sonny Argonzoni. He's been arrested 11 times, uh, he's been on drugs for 10 years, and, and he's been spending about $75 a day to support his habit. However, he has a case that's pending right now in Manhattan Criminal Court for a burglary charge. I wonder if you would go and represent uh, Sonny when he goes to court. And I can recall going up to the uh, one of the district attorneys who was presenting some of the cases, and especially Sonny's case, and I said to him, I said, sir, uh, I'm here on my own time. I'm a police inspector, 
and uh, I'm affiliated with Team Challenge. I wonder if we could do something for Sonny. Uh, Sonny has been delivered from drugs, and he's helping kids in Coney Island and Beffitt Stuyvesant and up in the Bronx. I wonder if he could help us so he wouldn't have to be incarcerated. The district attorney looked at me uh, eyeball, eyeball. He says, who are you kidding? He says, no one kicks the habit. Well, let me see what I can do. Then a judge spoke. He says, okay. He says, Sonny Argonzoni, he says, I'm going to give you a year in prison, but the execution of the sentence is suspended. I'm going to parole you in the custody of Inspector Delina and Teen Challenge. I hope that you'll be a good example. Well, uh, we were just delighted. We, we were beaming from ear to ear. And the, uh, the lawyers and the detectives and the policemen and Sonny's father began to cry and the Reverend argued why we just went out rejoicing in the Lord what, had he, what he had done. And uh, it was just, it's just so fantastic what had happened that we know that God had a purpose in releasing Sonny and what a great job he had done in the ministry of Teen Challenge. After using drugs for six years, I was desperate to change. I had been incarcerated 10 times. I kicked a countless number of habits. I had even tried going to Lexington, Kentucky for a six month cure. But the minute I hit the big city, I was back in the spoon. Then in the winter of 1962, I was invited to the Teen Challenge Center. It was here that I met the ex-gang member, Nicky Cruz. I remember the day when Sonny Argan Sonny walked in into this home I can see the scarf of sins right on his face. And for a half, he came with a lot of doubt. He had been through so many programs, had been locked up many times. He had completely lost the size of hope. And yet he walked in without expecting that he was going to come in into a miracle. The agony of a man that he needed a fix of heroin. A man that was perspiring, twisting, vomiting. A man that was craving like an animal for a, for a chemical that would give him some release or either some peace. This was no hospital. But we have Jesus Christ. And it has to be Jesus Christ who has to deal with the, with the problems, with the need, with the corruption, with the sin, of this man. It was in these streets that I first met David Wilkerson when he first came from Pennsylvania. When I first met him, I thought he was a narcotic agent and he was out to lock us up. I remember that many of us, we were scared at first, but then we found out that he came and told us that he was a country preacher. We all were really surprised because we wouldn't think that a country preacher would come all the way from Pennsylvania to these streets to tell us about the power of God. If you knew Sonny Arkansoni like I know him, you'd have to believe in miracles. I met him in the streets of New York, dirty, skinny, frightened, bound by drugs. If you'd have told me then that this young man there with a bullet hole in his leg, dirty needle marks in his arm, with a praying mother, would ever become a great man of God and a legend in his own time, I would have never believed it. It's been a great personal joy of mine to watch over the years this young man expand his ministry around the world. Sonny is known all of the United States in junkie land. You go to the streets of Harlem, they know about Sonny, they know about him in Los Angeles, the real junkie preacher. Pastor what we fondly call the all junkie church of Los Angeles. <laughs>
I said, what was that, that, uh, that man talking about? No. What was that? Victory, it was victory. Well, what, what's the name? Sunny Elkin, Zoni. Yeah, if you were interested, I'd tell him. Oh, this is what he gave me, um. Victory Temple. Where, what? St. Louis Street. 126, St. Louis. Maybe one of these days I'll go on. <laughs> you go to Jesus? Jam. Be careful with that. That's a good start. I don't want you to hold D on me, son. No, I saw that. It's getting harder now. Yeah. Don't finish. That's some good. That's some no more veins. That's some good stuff. Be careful, huh? started this ministry of victory outreach in uh, an area which is called the Flats or better known as Aliso Village. It's a ghetto type of area where, where there is gang problem and uh, many drug addicts that walk the streets and there are many projects in that area where the pe these people live. In this area is where my wife and I we moved into the project so that we could identify with the people there and also uh, go out and talk to the drug addicts and gang members in the streets. When I first met Sonny, I thought I was gonna be a missionary to Mexico. And little did I dream that I'd been married to a man that would have a call of God to go into the ghettos to win the rejects of society. I, uh, it was just so far from my imagination that, that he would be called in this way in the beginning of the ministry we had no support whatsoever all we had was sonny's vision that god was going to raise a mighty work so we had to move to the projects that's the uh, a housing project in los angeles and our rent was 36 dollars a month and sometimes we get two months behind on our rent but sonny that wouldn't that wouldn't discourage him at all he'd still go out and be talking to fellas and bringing them home for meals and 
One day, Sonny brought home six young men to talk to them in our living room about, about a new, new way of life for them. And very casually, he turned to me and told me, Julie, I want you to go to the kitchen and fix them something to eat. Well, at that moment, I didn't want to tell him, Sonny, there's nothing to eat in the kitchen because I didn't want to bring down the things that he was telling them. He was telling them how great and how good God was and how mighty he was. And if I was to turn around and say, well, there's nothing in the kitchen, I couldn't bring it, I couldn't bring it, the gospel down like that. So I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to go into that kitchen and I'm going to fix something to eat. When I went into the cupboards, I found a box of pancake mix, but with only a small little bit of it in, in, in the package. And, and I knew that God had to perform a miracle for me. I had a little bit of butter and a little bit of syrup, so I began to, to pray. And then I got a bowl and I poured the pancake mix in the bowl. I got a little bit of water and poured it in. And I just was believing God for it. I closed my eyes and began to pray and stir it. And right before my eyes, as I opened my eyes, I saw it come up to the top of the bowl. I had to grab another bowl and pour the rest of the mix inside the other bowl. And, and right before my eyes, God performed the miracle in providing for us. And I made pancakes for all the fellas and for Sonny. And God was glorified that day. Every time I, I think about how, how true God has been to his promises and, and how he's provided for us and how he's blessed us, I can't help but, but break before his presence because he's been so great and so mighty. that you're going to make tonight of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior will tell whether you'll be happy or miserable. You know why this will tell whether you'll be happy or miserable? It's because the person without Christ is a person that could never be happy. Now some people think, and especially young people, when they're walking that walk and talking that talk, you know what I mean by walking that walk and talking that talk? I mean, you know, that walk, you know, real, real bad, see, you know? <laughs> Or like you talk that talk, esta de aquella, or esta suave, huh? Uh, sometimes, you know, we take a look at Christianity, we hear about Jesus Christ, and we figure, man, that's only for squares. And you feel that there's a lot of fun in the things of the world, and, and getting high with wine or or enjoying the things of the world, you feel that's true happiness. But my friend, it can't be happiness without Christ. I'm not saying you don't get your kicks. You get a few kicks. When you get loaded, you get a kick for a little while. When you get drunk, you're, you know, walking around and getting a kick for a little while and you want to take on the whole world and fight everybody. And then you embarrass your girlfriend and throwing up all over your suit. <laughs> Those are kicks for a little while, but it's something that's not lasting. Well, you know, I won't be able to convince you, but there's someone else that is able to convince you. There's that little tugging that takes place deep inside our hearts that as you're sitting there, you begin to get nervous and something is happening inside. You don't know what it is, but something is bugging you. My friend, it's the Holy Spirit.
throughout the years, the church and the ministry ha has really grown. We outgrew that small building that we had in uh, Aliso Village that we first started out in, and now we're in our new building uh, here, and uh, it's still in East L.A., uh, but we have many people that, that come to the church, and the church just uh, tripled from when we first started. And uh, out of these people that have come in and have come into the church, there are some of them that have gone to Bible school and also graduated from Bible school, and now they're involved within the Victory Outreach Ministries. We have a few of them that are directors of, uh, of our homes. We have the Rehabilitation Home for Men. We also have uh, a Rehabilitation Home for Girls. We also have a ranch for boys. And then we have a very extensive uh, prison ministry where we have many people that are very much involved in the prison ministry. Nestled in the green rolling hills east of Los Angeles is the Hacienda Victoria, a refuge for young women who come here for help in kicking the heroin habit. Once out of the clutches of drug addiction, they shine forth as precious jewels, radiating the transforming power of God. You know, as I'm standing here and I see your faces looking at me, I remember when I first came into a home, when I first got off the streets, when I first stopped using heroin. You know, there was a time also when I was so strung out on drugs that I would try anything just to be able to make that next fix that I had to get because without that fix, I wouldn't be able to go on another day or maybe even another few hours. <laughs> it was such a possession on my life that I was just going almost insane. And uh, I believe most of you here have had this type of experience in your life. When you're just laying there, you know that there's no way that you're going to get out of it, and you go through them hours of a, of a sheer nightmare. It's, it's almost a living hell. That's what it is. It was during my uh, assignment to narcotics that I became aware of Victory Outreach. And at first, I guess like every other narcotic officer, I was very skeptical as to whether addicts could be converted or not. One day I was standing out on the sidewalk and I saw this girl who I knew was a longtime junkie. She was actually grabbing people as they walked by. He says, you know, one day I was in jail and somebody came and talked to me about uh, changing my way of life. I later found out that there was people from Victory Outreach through my contact with them and attending their church, I was converted and I gave up dope. I would have bet a million dollars that she never kicked a habit. That was quite a shock to me. And so I made a deal with her to uh, send her people that I would arrest and uh, see if she could do some good with them. One of the key facets of the Victory Outreach Ministries is our Victory Home Living Program. My name is Cal and this is my wife Beatrice. We're the directors of such a home. The homes play a twofold uh, purpose in that we work as a detoxification center and also we continue working with the individual once we have led him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Generally we try to work with the men of the local area by going down into the streets and working with him on a person to person basis. We find that there's a lot of problems in dealing with this type of, a, uh, of an individual, that is to say a drug addict. Number one, he comes from a background that is completely broken and, and confused and in total chaos. So it's quite a problem in, in, in trying to get some kind of order established in his life. But once he's come into the home and he's gone through his withdrawals, which generally takes a couple of weeks, we're able to work with him personally and then continue on working with his wife. The men that come here, their wives is um, a little different, I think, I believe a little more difficult because these women are, are bitter, They're, they've been hurt many years, and most of them have not known what it is to have a real husband, a real father to their children. So that when the men here do get converted and go to their wives, a lot of them at first will not believe that their husbands have changed. Just a few miles outside of Los Angeles in Victorville, California, 
is the Victory Boys Ranch. This ranch was established in 1972 because of the dire need to reach young gang members before they became involved in hardcore heroin addiction. Gene Rodriguez, a former addict, and his wife Cynthia are the ranch directors. They were both reached through the ministry of Sonny Argonzoni. Life's been cruel, life's been hard But don't you know that Jesus died So you could be a child of God I was born a child of darkness And I was raised a child of scorn Until I met the King of Kings And I found my life reborn When I was in, in institutions, uh, the majority of the counselors there did not come from the type of setting that I came out of. So they didn't understand. You know, many of the boys that come here can't say that because I come out of the same setting. You know, after being a drug addict for uh, so many years of my life and being in state prison and institutions, I find that, that I'm able to communicate with the boys, you know, and uh, uh, they can't say, well, you have not been through it and you don't know what's happening. Because I do know what's happening. I've been there. This is what Victory Boys Ranch is all about. It's working with them, the total boy, to eventually be the total man. People want to know, what can you do for me? But uh, they misunderstand that there isn't anything my wife and I can do. It's God that, that does it. Child of pain, child of sin. Life's been cruel, life's been hard. But don't you know that Jesus died so you could be a child of God? One of the many friends of Sonny Argonzoni's Victory Outreach program is TV and motion picture star Dale Evans. Her heartfelt concern for the youth of America has motivated her involvement in the Victory Outreach program. It was a great honor for me to meet Dale Evans, and I'd like to introduce her. Dale, would you come? Thank you very much. Do you know I've been blessed so much, I've heard so much tonight, I'm just ready to go home with a heart full of joy in Jesus Christ. Aren't you? Isn't it wonderful? You know, if anybody had ever told me about 20 years ago that I would be here in Apple Valley and seeing these wonderful boys give their testimony and being part, being privileged to be a part of this Victory Boys Ranch, I want to tell you, I would have said, well, you're, you're out of your mind. There are no trees up there in that desert. I would have said all kinds of things. But I want to tell you that I love this high desert. And I'm so thrilled that the Lord has seen fit to establish a home for these boys up here. And my son asked me to commit my life in total to Jesus Christ that night. I said, no, I'm in pictures. I said, I I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. I accepted him as Savior when I was 10. He said, but you don't know him. He said, what a difference. He said, if you really knew him in a personal, vital way, you could throw away all the books you read on peace of mind and Eastern cults and all the rest of it, release from nervous tension and you name them. I was reading all I could get my hands on to try to resolve guilt in my soul for wrongdoing. I couldn't sleep. It's all in here. The rules are here, and I had broken them, and I knew I had. And I said, give me a week to think about it. And I went home, and the Lord unraveled my life right in front of me. And I saw the sin in my life. The next Sunday, I went to that church, and I acknowledged Jesus Christ 
personally, and I ask him to come into my life and take it over in full and break my life if he had to, but use my life for his glory. And it's difficult to explain to you, just like these boys a while ago, it's difficult to say what happens when the Lord comes in like a flood, when he comes in by his Holy Spirit and washes your soul clean with the blood he shed on the cross of Calvary for that purpose and pours his Holy Spirit into your life and creates a new creature in Christ Jesus when you are born again. Freddie, it's me, Sonny. Oh, man, Open get out of here, Sonny. Listen, I don't want to hear it. Freddie, listen, I, I know I heard you just got out of jail, and I also here. heard oh, about your brother. Listen, somebody else, man. Listen, man, open the door. I got to talk to you. Listen to somebody else, man. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out Would you here, listen man. to me for hey, just a few moments? I don't listen. want to hear that. Christ is going to change your life, Christ Freddy. Gonna change he's going to he change can. your life. He's no, he can't. So I've been in prison and all of that. Man. Listen, he's done it for so many Get others, Freddy. Let now listen, God has been dealing with you. You know God has been dealing with you. No, he hasn't. Freddy, listen Get out of here. Go go somewhere else and tell somebody about your God, man. Don't tell me. Why don't you throw that knife away, huh? Why don't you give God a chance? You know, deep inside you want to serve God. God can't change me, God is able to change me. God can't, man. You just keep coming over here every day, man, bugging me, man. God is dealing with you like that. I don't want to change, man. There's a lot of feeling in your life, Freddy. God, God can't change me anyway. And he's going to change if you give him a chance. Listen, why don't you throw that knife away and give God a chance in your life? He's done it for so many others. He did it for Bobby. He did it for Cal. He did it for so many other guys. He's able to do it for you if you give him a chance. Why don't you just throw that knife away and turn your life over to him? You won't have peace. You won't have happiness until you surrender your life to God him. God can't change me. Yes, he could, God Freddy. Can't just me. try him. Give him a chance and he'll do the work in your life. Will you please give him a chance? In fact, right now he's working in you. This is God that's dealing in your life. Oh, God. Oh, God, help me, God. Oh, God, change me, God. Change me, God. Oh, God, change me. I'm tired. I'm tired, God, change me. <laughs> I remember when I used to walk these streets, man, and hang around in these corners, you know, and, and used to think that I was bad, but I was just putting a big front, man. And the inside, I was screaming for help. And these corners right here got me to prisons, man, to jails and prisons. And no, none of the homeboys and homegirls did nothing for me. They don't send you no money. They don't send you no, no letters or nothing like that. Until I got out and I met Jesus Christ, man. I could stand here and say that I'm a Christian and I'm proud, man, that I'm a Christian, man. And it takes more guts to stand here and say that you're a Christian than to stand there, man, with an emptiness inside your heart, just screaming for someone to give you a little bit of love, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of understand, of attention, man. And the one that could give you all that love and attention, man, is Jesus Christ, man. Lord, I come before you this day thanking you for all the wonderful things that you have done. Lord, when I think about these lives that at one time were wrecked by sin, where families were divided and there was no love within the homes, when I think about these lives that had to be out in the streets day and night working angles to support their habits, when I think about these young people that were out there in the streets without hope and without love in their hearts. But, oh God, you reached down your hand of mercy and you extended love unto them and you changed their lives. Oh Lord, I thank you also for 
the many, many more that will come into this beautiful experience. I thank you for the moving of thy Holy Spirit and reaching out to families and reaching out to young people and changing them. Oh, I thank you in advance for the wonderful things that you will continue to do. Lord, I pray that you continue to reach the attic. I pray that you continue to reach the gang member. I pray that you continue to reach these families that are lost and bound. And I will forever give you the glory and I will praise you for it because it's through your tender mercy and loving kindness that this is possible. Thank you, Jesus, for all the wonderful things you have done and for the many wonderful things that you will continue to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we stand to our feet. What a powerful, powerful video to show the history of our ministry. You know, that's what it's all about. It's about taking the gospel where the need is at. You know, someone was willing to answer the call of God going from all the way from Pennsylvania saying, you know what, there's a great need in New York. I'm going to go out there and preach the word. Not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing the impact that was going to take place all over the world by one man. David Wilkerson went and ministered to Nikki Cruz, and he travels all over the world preaching the gospel. Was able to reach Pastor Sonny. Now we, we're part of a worldwide ministry. Come on, give the Lord a big praise. And see, that's why evangelism is so vital and so important because you don't know the life that you would touch. You don't know the impact that you will make. You don't know that soul that is hurting and lost. And by you just telling them your testimony, just telling them about how good God is, what God can do in an individual's life. Because you know what? Someone did it for you. Someone told you about Jesus. And you know what? I want to do an altar call today. And this altar call is an altar call to say, God, use my life. The same way you use David Wilkerson, the same way you use Pastor Sonny, the same way you use Nikki Cruz, use my life to be a lighthouse and a testimony to my family, to my coworkers, to my peers in school, to those at the supermarket. And so I want to pray for a boldness today, a boldness to share the gospel with somebody. And so tonight, I just want to open up these altars. I just feel God wants to give you a freshness. God is envisioning you. God is reestablishing and reminding the call that he's placed upon your life. And that call is just simply telling somebody about Jesus here today. 
And for those that are tuning in online today, you watch this powerful video. And I believe God ministered to you. The same way God ministered, the same way God stirred us up here in the church, I believe God is stirring your heart right now. And God wants to use your life to tell somebody about Jesus. And so just all over this place, let that be your prayer tonight. Say, God, use my life to make a difference because you have a family member tonight, a family member that's on drugs. You have a, a family member that's in prison. You have a family member that is finding themselves in a suicidal state of mind. And God wants to use you to let them know that there is hope in Jesus tonight. Father, tonight, God, Lord, tonight, God, I believe you stirred something in our hearts, God. You stirred something in our heart, God, to say we are called to be victory outreach. We're called to share with others about the saving knowledge and the power of Jesus Christ, God, of letting people know, God, that there is hope, God, in you, God. Letting people know, God, that no matter the condition that they're in, God, they're in possible situation, that you're a God that is able to make something possible. You're a God of miracles here today, God. A God that is able to set the drug addict free. A God that is able to restore marriages. A God that is able to restore our minds, God. A God that is able to heal. A God that is able to deliver from depression and oppression, from suicidal thoughts, God. You're a God that is able to deliver from pills, God. You're a God that is able to deliver from alcohol, God, from drugs, my God. You're a God of miracles today, God. And so, Father, we're praying, God, that you would use us to be a lighthouse unto our families, God, into our jobs, into our schools, God, and wherever we go, God, that the same boldness, God, that you've given our founder, God, to preach the gospel, God, to go and preach, God, where no one wants to go, God, that same courage, God, God, give us that same boldness as well, God, so that we can let the world know, this dying world know that there is hope in Jesus tonight, God. So I I say a special prayer tonight, God. I pray, God, for a special anointing, God, an anointing upon your people, God, that you would fill their hands, God, you would fill their voice, God, with power, God, with authority, God, that wherever they go and they speak, God, that there's going to be lives they are going to impact, God, lives are going to be moved, God, lives are going to be transformed and changed by your power, because it's not us that does it, God. All we are are just vessels that are saying, willing to say, God, just use my life to make a difference. Use my life to make an impact, God. And so, Father, tonight, God, we want you, Lord God, to use our lives to make an impact today, God. So, Father, this week, Lord, God, place somebody in our path, God, that we're able to pray for, that we're able to encourage that we're able just to love on them, God, with the love of Jesus, Lord, because we know somebody, somebody, God, somebody, Lord, did it for us. And that's why we're here tonight in the church, because someone told us that there's a God that loves us despite of our flaws, despite of our failures, God, a God that is willing to take us just the way we are. Father, tonight, God, we just want to thank you for the opportunity, God, to be used for your honor and for your glory here tonight, Father. We want to just tell you that we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' name, give the Lord a big praise. Come on, give him a praise, amen. What a powerful, powerful move, God. I, I really feel in my spirit that God stirred something up each and, single, each and every single one of us today. And I also want to let you know that we are going to be doing our UTC alumni are putting on a crusade. Come on, somebody. And we're going to invade the city of Mesa, the surrounding cities for the glory of God. So stay tuned. See, many of you have been seeing it on Facebook, on Instagram. You're going to be hearing more details about it. But this is the year that God is going to use you. Come on, give the Lord one more big hand. Praise the Lord. Also, too, don't, I want to forget, I want to invite you to join us back this Sunday service. And next Wednesday, next Wednesday, I want you to invite somebody. We're going to be showing the motion picture, The Cross and the Switchblade. It's a legit movie, and we're going to be showing it. And uh, so we're going to be starting promptly at 7 o'clock. So make sure you get early, get your seats. But we love you. God bless you. God bless you, those online. We love you. God bless.